All right. Happy Friday to everyone. Uh, let's see. Need to get a few things straightened out here, and then we'll get this dive on the road. In the ocean? Get this dive in the ocean? Let's go with that. Okay. Uh, looks like we got sound, so I just need to get some of this stuff out of the way and the chat's going here. Happy Friday, uh, Paul SK. How's it going? Nice to see you. Uh, and see Grover as well. Uh, there, let's close that. Okay. So, uh, introduction for anybody that might be new. Uh, my name is Tim. This is the Deep Dive program. On this program, uh, this live stream, weekly live stream uh, that occurs at this time, we are working on various different things related to CircuitPython. If you are brand new and you don't know uh, what that is, uh, CircuitPython.org is a good place to learn more. The high level uh, view of it, the 50,000 foot view, if you will, is that we have Python code. Uh, that runs on these tiny computers. In this case, the uh, the computer is inside this main chip here. Uh, there's a whole tiny computer inside this thing, and we are writing Python code that executes on this computer, and it can interact with uh, other things uh, by virtue of all these different pins. So there's all different shapes and sizes of these devices. You can see I have two different ones here, uh, Raspberry Pi, Pico W, and in this case, a Feather um, ESP32 S2 uh, with a TFT screen on it. So um, these ones are fairly similar in size and shape, but there are lots and lots and lots of different form factors of these things. Uh, the thing that ties them all together uh, into this program, though, is that they all run um, CircuitPython, all the ones that I will be working uh, with. So uh, we're writing our Python code to run on these things. Again, if you're interested to learn more, uh, circuitpython.org, that's a good place to start. Uh, also join us over in the Discord. We have a CircuitPython uh, dev channel if you're interested in actually getting involved in the development. It's an open source project, so all the development and coordination uh, occurs out in the open uh, on GitHub and Discord. Um, or if you have a CircuitPython device and you're having uh, trouble or you want to know how to do something that you don't know, uh, there's also a help with CircuitPython channel over on that Discord where you can uh, get help or any kind of information you need uh, for whatever you're trying to do, uh, be it a CircuitPython project or, uh, you know, help contributing or with infrastructure or just help hooking up your project or whatever. Um, so head over there. If you are interested uh, in kind of being involved in the community, um, Adafruit, uh, this is their website, adafruit.com. Adafruit is a hardware and software company based out of New York. Uh, they are the company that is primarily funding the CircuitPython project. It is an open source project, so anyone is allowed uh, to use CircuitPython. Uh, anyone is allowed to make a device and, uh, and port CircuitPython to run on that device um, free of charge. Um, but Adafruit is the company that is actually paying the folks who work on the CircuitPython project. There's a, a team of folks who work on the project full time. Uh, there's other folks like me who work on the project part time. Adafruit is the one uh, paying us to uh, work on it. So if you uh, just like the project, you're not interested in maybe developing or anything like that, but you just like the project and you want to get yourself some neat toys, if you uh, purchase hardware from Adafruit.com, um, that is indirectly helping CircuitPython because, of course, they're you know if you're paying them for products and they're paying us and the folks who work on uh, the software, uh, then that's what makes this whole thing go round. So uh, thank you to everyone who wants to purchase hardware from them. They, of course, sell uh, the microcontrollers, such as the ones that I had back here. Uh, they sell both of these devices. This one, in fact, is a, an Adafruit manufactured device as well, uh, whereas this one is third party. That's a Raspberry Pi, uh, although they do sell them, Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, so yeah, thank you to Adafruit. Thank you to everyone who purchases hardware from them. And so uh, jumping into it for the night, let me also catch up here. Hello from Sweden, uh, one hour to Christmas. Uh, oh, wow, ha uh, Merry Christmas, I should say, then, uh, Axel. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, how's it going, Blaze and Beata over there in the YouTube chat? So um, 
diving into today's topic, what I want to look into is uh, kind of hot off the presses, so to speak. This is um, relatively new stuff that changes the way that we will store um, essentially uh, like secret uh, variables, um, environment variables, things like tokens, uh, passwords, um, you know, things like that that are secure that you don't necessarily want to have in your code. Um, so. You know, those of you that work on CPython might be aware of the idea of a, an environment file where you can put your you know, environment um, variables, your tokens, and your login information, your authentication details, and things like that. Um, in CircuitPython, we have recently changed the way that this works from, uh, well, it's actually you know, a flurry of activity has occurred. Like um, originally we used a file called se uh, secrets.py. Uh, there would be a dictionary inside of there. You would put your, you know, for instance, Wi-Fi username and password uh, or your API tokens for whatever services you want. Put those in your secrets pi file uh, and then you import that uh, dictionary and you access those um, variables off of that secrets object. This was kind of the way that it was done for a very long time. Uh, more recently, we got a uh, .env file, uh, .env, and we got the ability uh, to read .env files. Uh, they have a particular uh, format. I don't know the format, like the, the syntax off the top of my head, but if you search like .env, uh, this is actually a larger project, right? This was not specific to CircuitPython. We just, um, you know, we got an implementation of this uh, .env. So we were able to read from that file. This kind of started to replace the idea of secrets.py. Uh, but even more recently, uh, we decided to switch it up to actually TOML uh, for a few reasons about uh, differences in the syntax, being able to use certain types of strings um, and how certain stuff interacts with uh, creating the file. It's actually, I guess, a bit difficult to create a .env file in some environments because uh, some OSs don't want you to just create a file that starts with a, uh, with a dot. So uh, they make it a little bit more difficult than it should be to do that. And so um, a, a switch was warranted. It was discussed during the, the weekly meeting a couple of weeks back. Toml uh, was the choice. The new implementation is in for settings.toml. Uh, and importantly, there has been a new release, so we can download this and, uh, and try it out. So this is actually my, the first time for me uh, accessing settings.toml. So my aim is to kind of uh, just see, try it out, make sure everything is working how I understand it, get it running on one of my devices. In particular, another thing I want to also try it with is uh, on the Pico. I think maybe there is web workflow on the Pico now. Pico W, I should say. Uh, so that should go along uh, go along with this. Um, if that is in that indeed um, implemented now on the Pico, then I'll give that a try. Uh, and then after that, um, the next thing I want to get into is actually like the GIST API. So GIST is a text storage thing. Uh, owned by GitHub or, or hosted by GitHub or whatever. Uh, and I would like to try out posting data into GIST from CircuitPython, uh, maybe using that as like IoT logging um, with the logging library and stuff like that. So uh, we'll get into that later on. Uh, but first things first, uh, let's look into the new settings.toml. And so the way this works is we need to have a, well, first of all, we need to have basically brand new CircuitPython. Uh, so I'm going to head back to circuitpython.org. I'm going to go to downloads right here. Uh, my device is a Raspberry Pi Pico. W. So probably Pico W will come up, right? So beta 6, I believe, is where this got added. Uh, I could be wrong about that. I'm not 100% certain, but it's certainly very new. Uh, and beta 6 is the newest one, so that's what I'm going to download. Can't have comments uh, in JSONs. Uh, in Toml, you can. Uh, good question. I do not know. Yeah, you cannot in JSON. That part I do know. Uh, no comments in JSON. Um, although, worth noting, our secrets pi, it was, uh, it was Python. So you could have comments inside of there. Um, although JSON was proposed. I think, uh, I think I proposed using JSON at some point, And that is definitely one of the biggest downsides of it is no comments. Um, no comments, um, which I do agree with, and that is a bummer. Tomil, I don't know actually though. Tomil, can we have comments? Well, let's check here. Does it say on the page? So this one, yeah, comment. Looks like it does. Yeah, nice. And then I don't know about .env either. Uh, although I probably won't look too much into .env since it turns out that we changed changed it up to Tomil anyway. 
So I'm I'm actually not super familiar with the Tomal um, syntax. It looks like it's basically just key values on new lines and then uh, sub table goes down here. Although I don't know, I think yeah, only root table can be retrieved. So essentially, I mean it's almost like that inf or whatever, like old configuration files where it was key value. It's like you can do spaces, same as above. Oh, okay, just, yeah, okay. Supports UTF in various ways. Uh, new lines, escape codes, okay. DMV. So to start with, we're gonna just put that on the device. Uh, I'm gonna do the Pico W first. Actually, it's a bit tricky because uh, does the double tap reset? Well, there is no reset, right? Double tap reset I think would work, but I don't actually have a cowbell or anything on it, so there is no reset button. So what I'm gonna do is actually I think you can hold boot while you plug it in, is that right? No, is this plugged in? Yeah, I think so. Ooh, ouch. Then I guess let go. Yeah, there we go. That is pasting right now, presumably. There we go. Uh, I'm going to scooch the camera just a bit here and angle it back this way. Fix the focus. Still alive? Yeah, okay. Okay, right. I think we should be onto the newest version. Let's not open secrets for one thing. Check boot out. Okay, there we go. Eight beta six. So I will make a settings.toml. Settings.toml. Uh, we'll put some key values into the here. I'll just put some kind of bogus ones to try it out. Um, let me fix my chat here. We'll say maybe hello message equals hello deep divers. Then it, I think it was just new line, right? Yeah, it looks like new line, another one. So then let's say uh, number value equals uh, can you have hex in here? I don't actually know. Maybe we should do an actual number though. So it's color value green. Um, it's kind of the best majority of what I would be interested in is strings, numbers, colors would be a nice touch if it works. That's all I really am. Interested in having myself. So then, uh, what is inside code right now? So this is. Uh, this is uh, like trivia, web server trivia, I think. Let me get rid of it. And now to read our tumble file, we can go, I believe, import OS, and then uh, os.get env. And then do we need to give it a key? Yeah, I guess it looks like we probably need to give it a key. Let's see if it prints anything if we don't. I'm curious if we get the full dictionary. No, okay, required argument. So uh, let's go, what did we put in there? Hello message. Uh, hashtag comments. So same as Python, which is nice. Okay, there we go. So we got Hello Deep Divers out of there. So let's check our other two number value, color value. 
I think you can do Octal. Oh, interesting. Octal. It looks like both of those worked. Uh, I don't know the color hex is off the top of my head, so let's also go hex. Is that right? That's, right. That's not right, is it? Oh, it is. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it didn't put the leading zeros. Cut off the leading zeros, but uh, we did get our green there. Okay, cool. Uh, octal? I don't know. Is it octal... Um, octal value? How do you do that one? Is it O? It's like... Zero O? Like to type in that string. Done. This is probably just out of date stubs or something. O one one is nine, not eleven. Only integers supported by string two O L C R two O L. O zero, no OB, no O underscores. Let's say that on the page. Got this. I don't know if that's right. Is there a, I don't know, is there, does that actually work? Yeah, it seems to work. I didn't know this existed. I don't think I've ever used an octal number that I can think of. A lot of hex, a lot of binary, a lot of base 64, a lot of base 10. Okay. So that is pretty darn straightforward. Um, next thing I wanted to look at was the web um, workflow, web workflow. Uh, so if for that to work, we need these things. We also need these things. put these as blank and then I'll fill them in and we won't be able to look at this file on the stream anymore, but I'll show you at least what it's looking like before those are filled in. Or default 80, that's probably fine. Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, password. Uh, gonna try to follow, gonna try to follow when you are using your HDD and when you're changing files on the device. We talked about this before where to develop your code, and the reasons for not doing it on the device. It's very hard to follow all your clicks. Do you mind pointing out when you're on your uh, HDD and when you transfer it to the device uh, when you de and when you develop on the device? Yeah, I'll try to, um, I will try to point that out right now. So I am actually, I am editing code directly on the device right now. I'm editing it inside of uh, PyCharm. And PyCharm is also showing me all of this code up here, which happens to be on my hard drive. But right now we're not looking at any of that stuff or I should say we're not doing anything with any of it right now. Uh, and then CircuitPy we have right here, which is the CircuitPy drive uh, of right now the Pico W just plugged in there. Um, and in this case, code.py, which I edited here, that is on the device, and settings.toml as well, that is uh, on the device, just in the root of code.py. Uh, and I will try to call out when I switch back and forth um, to stuff on the PC. Uh, so I will save that. It will be on. It will be on the CircuitPy drive. But then, uh, unfortunately, I got to pull this over to here for a moment so I can fill in some of these details, and then we'll close this one, and I won't have uh, settings.toml open. 
anymore since it will have my stuff in it. Um, actually, I think I have some of the same stuff in here. But yeah, I do, I do switch back and forth a fair amount, a lot, especially if I'm working on a library, uh, like working on a PR test or anything like that, then I am constantly bouncing back and forth for sure. Uh, web API password. Actually, I'm going to add another one while I'm here, which is going to be a GitHub API token. I have no idea if it's going to work or not. Oh, actually, yeah, I'm not, because I don't see it in there. Maybe I can plug this one in. I'm gonna plug in my feather. Look inside of secrets on there, which I also can't show, so there's nothing else to see, but... If I can find it, we are going to put a GitHub API token into settings Toml as well to use once we uh, get started with gist. Of course, I don't know if this token is live or not. So we'll find out. Get a new one if not. That's there, save that, close everything. Close this, close this, close this. Uh, that one's fine. Yeah, that one's fine. We're back. Octal was very useful for working with a front panel, uh, front panel manually operated uh, bootloader switch array on many computers, like the DEC PDP series. Uh, do you think a Python environment like this would be convenient for working with a separate uh, multiple microcontrollers aside a main board slash chip? Uh, let me see. I'm not sure if I understand the question. Do you think a Python environment like this would be convenient for working with a separate, uh, i.e. multiple, assume that's what you mean there, kind of like so separate slash multiple microcontrollers aside from the main board and chip? So... Uh, if I understand the question, it's essentially like if you had multiple microcontrollers that work together inside one project or something like that, um, do I think this would be a convenient environment, the Python environment? If you mean like my editor, uh, the PyCharm editor, um, I am certainly biased. I, I will be you know totally upfront about the fact that I'm definitely very biased, but I think PyCharm is a good editor for anything that involves Python. So yeah, if you have... Uh, multiple microcontrollers and you're writing Python code for those microcontrollers. Uh, if you have, you know, they're, you know, let's say two or three of them connected at once. Um, PyCharm is fine for that. Uh, just a moment ago, you know, you, you all were not able to see it. Uh, you can actually see the remnants of it right here. I actually had two devices connected uh, and the second one just shows up as CircuitPy1. Uh, you can also rename these so they show up as whatever name you want. Uh, to keep your stuff organized and you can open files on each one edit some code save it. it it saves to the right one you don't have to worry about what's where and all that stuff uh, it keeps track of it for you so uh, personally if that's what you mean like this editor do i think it would be good for uh, editing on multiple devices at once i do uh, but like i said i am definitely biased i use it you know daily right i use it for for my day job i use it for circuit python i use it for fun projects i use pycharm uh, and similar IDEs for a lot of stuff, and I have for quite a while, so um, I've also just grown accustomed to it in a lot of ways. So we should be, I think, automatically connecting to the network now and uh, theoretically having the web workflow, I think. However, I don't know... How do we know the IP? That's tricky. We don't have a way to know the IP, do we? So circuitpython.local is supposed to work, I think. Is that right? Let's look for the web workflow. 
I could be wrong too, maybe it's still not working on this device. I think we have a better chance if I can find the IP. Maybe we should use this. I will say I haven't used specifically code.circuitpython.org before. I've only done it with the one that's built in. Wi-Fi.radio. Thank you. Um, another reason, if you're interested in more reasons why I think PyCharm is helpful, a good IDE for this is like the terminal, you can have multiple tabs here. So you could have uh, different serial connections to different devices. Right now, I just have the one connection to my one device, but you could have as many devices as you have. You could have different tabs here and be serial on all of them. Import Wi-Fi. Uh, print Wi-Fi dot radio radio dot IP four address no IP four maybe it's V four we'll do some durs around yeah there it is okay V four uh, one thirty two we need to do this here let's just say oh maybe this did this do HTTP I don't actually know let's go straight to the IP for now. But then this is HTTPS, but it redirects. Uh, hmm. Other redirecting. Uh, just wants to redirect. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Why can we not do that? Port 80? If I say port 80? But specifically HTTP. Just redirects me right there. Disable HTTPS everywhere. Is that a... Do I have that enabled? Just browse through this on here, probably. Uh, is that a setting, or is that like an add-on? I don't think I enabled that. I will say, like, I use HTTP for localhost servers all the time. I don't have any issue. This one is different, though, because it's not actually localhost to the machine. I think it's on by default. Firefox preferences, privacy, scroll down. Can I find? Yes. Uh, it is currently don't enable HTTPS only mode. So that's cool. Uh, unfortunately, it's just not respecting that, I guess. Used to be an add-on, but I believe it was integrated. Maybe, I think the thing is it got like cached or whatever, right? I think it's like, now it's like cached to redirect or whatever. I think if I would have done it explicitly the first time, it might have worked. No, I don't know. Is Chrome any different? Okay, this one thinks that, yeah, this one at least seems to think that it did. Clear caches uh, or new private. I tried private, that one didn't seem to make a difference, but we'll try Chrome here. That one seems at least one step further. 
Um, however, we did still not get... Do I need slash code, though? Does it still have an index page? Home or anything? Maybe it's not actually on the Pico W. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do at the same time here. I'm going to copy this. A copy of it here. Okay. So I did just copy a copy of settings.toml uh, from my Pico W to my local computer. So now I do have a copy of that settings.toml on my local computer. I don't want to open it up, uh, but I do now have a copy on there. So what I'm about to do is actually switch to the feather uh, and just see, like, maybe I'm misremembering. Maybe the Pico W doesn't actually have web workflow yet. Um, I'm pretty sure the feather does. So we'll test that out as kind of a sanity check. Or maybe web workflow doesn't work with Pommel. That could be possible too. I don't actually know. Um, so that's kind of what we'll discover here. HTTP 132 should get you to the... Okay, so there should be... Okay, so if we can get everything working, uh, we should see the welcome page if we just hit the root URL. Feather TFT. Ooh. doesn't come up as feather tft tft this is a uh, s2 although i actually have enough an, an f an s3 on my desk as well finally bootloader web workflow works with toml in beta 6 okay Web workflow was added in beta 5. Okay, so we should be good on the Pico W. We will sanity check this and then get back to the Pico W because I do want to try it out there. Appreciate the confirmation, by the way. Always good to like know the thing you're headed for at least is like intended to work. Should look through re uh, release notes more carefully, maybe. All right, there we go. So now I have, um, now the Pico is unplugged and the feather right here is plugged in. I'm gonna, I gotta move this back because I'm gonna copy that settings toml over to the feather now. And uh, while I do think PyCharm is pretty nice, one of the things that it does is when you copy paste a file, it opens that file. Of course, I don't want my settings HTML file open, so we'll move that back. But now I now have a copy of that on this device as well so that we could access it using that os.get environment. Uh, theoretically, so this one also has a screen which should also show its IP address. Um, if we stop taking it over with this stuff, One thing, oh no, it did actually work, okay. I got 113 it looks like. We might be able to focus it a little better. about as good as it gets. It's like 113. That's interesting. Oh, no, it's redirected again. Oh, 
That was interesting. It like loaded some more after it failed. Oh. There we go. So that works for me in Chrome on the Feather. Hitting the IP address with HTTP. For whatever reason, Firefox, even though that thing is disabled, just does not want to go directly there as HTTP. Takes an extra second to load this time. Is it still going to fail? Unable to connect. Did connect over there that time. Strangely, it seemed to like finish right when I clicked through here, which is weird. Yeah, I don't know. That was very odd. Uh, we did eventually make it to here though in Firefox. Maybe I should have stayed in Chrome though, or maybe I broke it by switching. I send it a request while it was already in a request. And it takes a while for the pages to come up. Yeah, I have seen that before. Or if we can get this back. All right. The file's there. I'll just stick to Chrome, it seems. We didn't, we didn't have the HTTPS issue, but we also, uh, it seemed to load faster a couple of times I tried it. So, so you're wearing mittens. Um, is it really colder in the States than it is here in Sweden? Uh, not even a thousand miles from home. Um, yeah, I have, so I have finger, finger, fingerless gloves. I have gloves with the fingers cut out right now. Um, I, so I don't know the, I definitely don't know the weather in Sweden. I think you're probably much further north than I am, so I would expect the average temperature where you're at to be colder than the average temperature where I'm at. That being said, uh, it is winter here, and even more specifically, we're actually in the middle of our first like real winter cold snap. So uh, the temperature right now where I am at is outside, let's say, which is important. Uh, it is um, nine degrees, nine degrees um, Fahrenheit with wind and the wind chill makes it feel like below zero. And it's actually probably the hottest part of the day right now. It was actually much colder than that today. Uh, it feels like negative eight. Fahrenheit right now because of the wind outside 13 miles per hour wind yeah we had basically all day it felt like below uh, zero like below negative five honestly I don't think we ever got past that for the fuel temperature uh, so very cold where I am at today we got a little bit of snow yesterday not too much luckily um, but very cold coldest few days of the years uh, so far by a pretty good Long shot of the season i should say i don't remember back to january maybe we got colder back then but ip address i think is most direct uh host names will have to get translated yeah i know like i'm pretty sure c is it circuitpython.local i think is supposed to work um i have not had success with that one personally i tried it a few times maybe i got it like once but i think the majority of the time i tried this one i did not have luck I'm good with direct though. So I will switch back to the Pico. Uh, I'll put the camera. Negative five here uh, in Chicagoland feels like negative 29. Yeah, worse in the more Northern states. Yeah, my uh, my partner at work is um, up in Michigan. And uh, the worst of it, I guess, is coming to him today. It's like ma mainly the same storm. But yeah, he was having the same kind of deal where like, Wind chill temperatures were like negative 20, negative 30. Have you uh, ever tried have you ever tried my app for the web workflow? I haven't had time to work on it lately. I'd love to know your opinion. 
uh, though it's possibly annoying to launch on Linux as you need Node. Um, the do you mean the like library uh, management? It's like a web interface for Circup kind of uh, kind of situation. Is that the thing you're talking about? Uh, let's see. So we'll assume that we're on 132 again. Um, that seems fairly safe. Should I put the HTTP back? Yeah, let's do it. There you go. So you just obviously have to, you know, put your feather in, put your feather out, do the hokey pokey a little bit, and then just plug your Pico back in and you're good to go. Um, uh, it's an app that finds and connects to the web. Oh, okay. No, I have not used that. Uh, let me try it though, because I am interested. I have used Disco Tool a little bit. Not as much as I should, though. I should get more into it, truthfully. Uh, let me... This one over here. Okay, uh, why do we have this over here now? Let's uh, use uh, the web workflow. The main code is now for the Electron app. There's no guarantee that it'll run in the browser anymore. In fact, browser security features make it a uh, prelude to that, so I finally gave up. Yeah. Browsers are tough for that. List of boards connected to respond to. Oh, interesting. Multiple ones can respond to that. Library installer. So you would clone this. You would do. So I should. I have. I think I have npm. If not, I can install it. I think I should have it though for work stuff. Let's go. Oh. Got me with the uh, you got me with the Bitbucket special right there is what I call that where it has Git clone in the in the copy. I always I think I'm always copying this and I write my own Git clone, but uh, inside Bitbucket they actually put that in there. This time I don't know why I saw it because it's in the README. I don't know why I did it anyway, but clone that and then npm install. Let's open this one. I'll open it. I, I like getting this stuff just. Instead of using the terminal over there by itself, let's get it to where we can see the files and everything. Uh, I will do it from this one just because that's next door. I guess device workspace is now too. What was this called though? CircuitPython. Sometimes this needs to refresh. I'm not cloning the right space. Webpacker, is that it? Oh, isn't it, was it? What's it, okay, packager. Window. Okay, so we go uh, into it, which this is where that will spawn. We go npm install, npm start, npm install. I don't actually have npm. I'm surprised. I, do I have Node? Yes. Surprised by that, truthfully. Um, I will install it. Um, that's the old name. My binaries for Mac and Windows I haven't figured out how to do it on Linux when browsers decided not to display it should be created a lot of confusion. Yeah, I would agree with that. I dislike the design choice of browsers to magic that away into a button and an icon or whatever. Um, yeah. Should just show you the full URL, I think. They did not ask me for my opinion. Do I, uh, do I need node as well, or is this going to get... Oh, it looks like some node stuff went by. This is probably going to get node for me. I'm actually surprised. I, I guess I just didn't get it on this computer yet. Must not have gotten it on this computer yet. We're, I'm running out of those things, slowly but surely. Fewer and fewer things that I run by where I'm like, I don't have that installed yet. Oh, that's interesting. Got a little snake. 
loading thingy there. Hope it runs. I mean, it's very, very likely that my environment's wonky if it doesn't run. I don't know. Do you need special PC specs to code with Adafruit? Uh, good question over in the YouTube. Um, generally speaking, I would say the answer to your question is no. You don't really need special PC specs. One of the best things about CircuitPython, in fact, is that the devices show up as a thumb drive. Um, is it a thumb drive? I don't know why it asked me for that. That was just my computer being weird. Uh, the devices show up as a thumb drive, and you can edit the code file with whatever you want. If you're already familiar with the text editor, you can use it. Uh, if you're not familiar at all, there's one called MU, MU which is uh, does not require a very fancy or fast um, or expensive computer. You can use you know relatively low-end hardware, and you should be able to edit your CircuitPython files just fine. I will say, if you're interested in like contributing uh, to the extent that I do. Um, you know, working on repositories, working on building uh, CircuitPython, building the core and stuff like that. Um, you know, a faster computer with more RAM is certainly a helpful thing. You know, it, it will help you be more efficient, um, but it's not a requirement, right? You can just as easily do all of the same things. Certain ones of them will take more time, um, but there's nothing that you just subjectively can't do. Um, unexpected. Oh, where we even made it to here. Next position. Code mirror build helper build. Unexpected token. Uh, we can try to find the log. Anything more helpful in there, or is it the same stuff that it prints? This is another place where I wish uh, the text would just stay. This this is a text, but not really, but kinda, but not really. But kinda, but not really. Kinda. Not finding it though. It just doesn't find anything because now it's like search and search is a different thing. Somehow there is a way to type into this, but I don't know what it is anymore. That frustrates me as well. That's basically the same thing, the same argument as the browser, in my opinion. Making this thing not writable, even though it's a, an input, is essentially the same concept. They're, they're simplifying text inputs too far to the point where they're no longer helpful, in my opinion. Interesting, there's two different ones. Why this copy is like this sometimes. Hmm. Timing non completed verbose, complete error log, bug log. Isn't that the one I did? Yeah, that's the one I did. Uh, I think that's a very appropriate question, truthfully. We did get the same error. I'll check the other one. You know, I guess the new one. I really wish I could open this. Huh? I guess I can go like click through here, but it's like I don't understand why. I don't 
don't know. Honestly, I'm probably missing something. I don't know. I don't do JavaScript, like Node.js building enough to really be able to troubleshoot it. But I'm guessing that there's like something I'm missing. I mean, do I, let's make sure I actually have Node. Really, I would need Node. I'm guessing that got installed, yeah. By apt. So, I don't know. We'd have to dig a bit farther. Code mirror? Missing a code mirror? Unfinished? Refi? You want to hijack? Yeah, no worries. Edit log. Build helper. Extensions? They're like a uh, top level extensions thing? I don't know. CM build helper. Code mirror build helper. Does seem like maybe code mirror? Uh, could be if that's a thing that needs to be installed. Maybe we're missing that. Used Move for most of my CircuitPython programming. Uh, started to use VS Code for a couple of large projects. Nice. Yeah, we have a lot of folks. I've seen several folks mention they like VS Code. Um, and I don't have anything against it. I just have been using PyCharm for a long time. So I kind of just got you know grandfathered in, so to speak. I just keep using it because it's easy to keep using it. Um, but lots of folks really like uh, CircuitPython. I mean, um, VS Code as well. Your layout's already set up to work that way. It might be missing. Let's see, from let me. Uh, sorry, from my experience using Bear SSL, completely different library and scene language, but it might apply here. How to apply certificates for HTTPS in order for certain things to work within a browser? Your layout's already set up that way. It might be missing, or you need to set it up to work with HTTP, like what Anik Data was saying. Uh, how's it going, DJ Devin? Hey, I got. I did get the um, uh, cowbell. Um, Cowbell uh, sequencer came the other day. I got it open. I have looked at it. Um, I have gazed in uh, amazement at the um, both the front and the back, honestly, of the PCB. Uh, so great job on that. I have not built it yet, but that is like um, starting in the next couple of days here, probably after Christmas, when I've got some time off uh, and I'll be home. Be getting down on the soldering with that one. So thanks again uh, for offering to send that, by the way. Definitely really appreciate it. Once I get it together, uh, I will spend some time on stream playing with it. Uh, I don't have a, an easy way to do the soldering and stuff on stream with the camera and everything, but once I get it built, we will uh, we'll do some coding. We'll tinker around with it on stream some. Um, yeah, I would definitely need certificates and stuff like that if we wanted to do... If we wanted to actually access it via HTTPS, we would for sure need some additional setup. In this case, though, I am just trying to do HTTP. And we did it. We eventually got it there, in fact. Can't use Moo at the moment due to unexpected Mac OS incompatibility. There's in a fix. Uh, there is a fix in the works. So real uh, soon right now. Yeah, I heard uh, issues about Mac. Yeah, I do think they mentioned, I think during the most recent uh, weekly meeting, I think somebody mentioned the new one was updated somewhere. I don't know, like it might, you might not be able to actually get it automatically or something yet. Um, I haven't followed it super closely, but I remember hearing about that a couple of weeks back, the, uh, the issue with Mac OS causing trouble with writing or something like that. I did remember hearing that about that. I've been trying to cram a six month uh, Google IT. Oh, wow. Six month course into six days. So far, I've done 15 weeks worth of course uh, and I've done it in two days. My goodness, that is a lot of uh, IT coursework. That is a lot. Oh, how come I can't edit? Oh, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's eject that. Do I need to refresh this page then? There we go. Okay. Less save. So now if we go back, how do we get, there's a serial? Yeah. Am 
Nice. There's our edited uh, code. So that does appear to be working now, which is pretty awesome. So, I think I will... Should we keep using the web workflow? So one thing I've never used is code.circuitpython.org. Is it... I don't know how this part works though. So is, do I not need to load this page first? Slash code, should I, can I go just direct here slash code? There's also this state path null, I don't know what all of this stuff. So this is also a different name, 0301232 something. I don't know if this stuff works. I think I may not, just don't know how to use this part of it. And then I think the local thing just doesn't, it's, it's something about my network. Oh, now we made it here, okay. Something about the dot .local thing, my network doesn't jive with very well, it seems like. All right, uh, let's give it a try. We'll give it a try. Uh, I'll switch back to PyCharm if we run into trouble with this, but I'll, I'll try this out like this. This will be an interesting experiment to try just using the editor in here. Like I said, I haven't used code.circuitpython.org before, so I've never used this one that's like kind of halfway reskinned or whatever. It looks like a more complete editor than the bare bones one that we saw back here. Um, I will have to jump a bit back and forth, though, because where I want to get to is uh, doing gist stuff. So to start, let's do bare bones. Let's try to make a gist. Slash code, thank you. Only discovered the semaphore wouldn't work until right before you shipped them. Oh, yeah, no, I'm not worried about that. I'm excited to build the thing and just use it for the sequencer bit. Uh, documenting a, a workaround uh, dodge. Learn more about Linux administration in the past two days than 10 years. A lot to take in. Determined to try to finish before Christmas. Dang. Did write some code for the cowbell. Uh, stuff near doc work. Uh, wrote his way better. Nice. I'll have to get that loaded up. Is that on uh, Is that on GitHub somewhere? I didn't see near docs shared, but I have been absent from the Discord in the past couple of days, truthfully. Uh, all the things... Let's see, actually, it's all the... Uh, oh, all the things still running 10.11 or 10.12 for Mac OS versions. I gotcha. So we're gonna need to make a post, and we're gonna need to edit some header things on it. Uh, yeah. So, let's try to do that. To start with, I'm actually going to go to the request library. Requests, CircuitPython is inside of here. Example, there will be something that has a post. Uh, we'll do, so do I need to, yeah, you still need to set up Wi-Fi inside your Python code. Does, does using Wi-Fi from the Python code mess up the web workflow? Let's 
We will be doing secrets differently. Your Dex version uh, is the current version in your GitHub. I see. Uses async IO switches, link toggle. Nice. Oh, interesting. Okay. Oh, can I copy? I'm going to just get up to the. Actually, I'm just going to take all of this. We'll cut out the parts we don't need. Some stuff like secrets, we're not going to do this anymore. We are going to have import OS. We'll just get rid of this print. We'll just say connected. Oh, highlighting is a, a little bit wonky in my case. Probably the dark mode is maybe throwing it off some. Connected. We need the IP? We already know the IP, right? It's going to be the same as we have, probably. All right, so here we do need different things. Um, and in my case, they're actually just the same is these. You should, uh, let's see, no, you cannot have a uh, web workflow and Wi-Fi and code, just don't start a server. Oh, you can, excuse me, you can have web workflow and Wi-Fi and code, just don't start a server on port 80 or change uh, the default. So change the default port if you want to start a server on port 80, okay. So as long as we're doing outgoing traffic, we should be able to make requests out to the internet and get data back. And I'm not running a server other than the web workflow, so we should be good there. Let's see if we get connected. httpbin.org slash post. Maybe I'll look into that one as well. I'm interested in if any of these like text posting services offer an append API, I would really love to be able to append some new data to a file without having to send a full new file. Just do the post for now. Oh, control S doesn't work on this one. I want to add that. And that takes you over to here. Okay, there we go. So we sent the we sent the data to the server. That seems to have worked. Get back to our editor here and then uh let's say just uh let's the highlighting seems like it doesn't work for my my color scheme or something, I'm guessing. When I do multi lines it's fine, but oh Oh, interesting. That deleted the third line, too. Okay. Hmm. So I'm curious about using one of these, like, paste bin type services as, a, as logging for an IoT device. I was messing with the logging library in MQTT last week. And it got me thinking about like using gist or paste bin or http bin these kinds of things as uh 
as output for a logger, essentially. So if you have a remote IoT device that's not easy to get to U USB on, you could still have it like outputting data for you somewhere. Um, outputting logging information in particular, ideally, as long as the network's not messed up. Um, just send it directly to API GitHub gists is the base URL. Seemingly. And that's saying that we're going to send a post. We're going to need to presumably set up these headers, which is, uh, I think, do you pass headers in here, maybe? And it can be just a dictionary, I think. Okay. Ours will have all of these things. It's going to actually take them like this. Oops. Oops. Okay. I don't know what I called the uh I don't know what I called the API token. I mean this one should like give us a error of some sort. Oh we got a syntax error in fact. Before. Is our headers? Oh. Needs to be a string. Could actually want to be saying, oh, yeah, this is actually syntax error, also, right? Headers we need to fill in. Ah, control S. I want to get control S going. Expected key value for dict 31. Uh. key value expecting e colon value for dict 31 the like new line or something Uh, why in line 23 say connected? How do you know that you're connected? Uh, I think if this... I think if we don't get successfully connected, this will raise an exception, I believe. I could be wrong about that, though. Um, but that's, that's what I think. That's the way I think it works, is this would raise an exception. Therefore, if we get to here and no exception has been raised, then uh, I think we know that we are connected. I could totally be wrong about that though but that's my understanding one of the exercises in windows powershell took uh, 45 minutes same thing in linux took five thanks would there be an exception if yeah so i'm definitely very confused about this dictionary one i feel like
Oh, okay. Well, maybe we... Is this... Is this... Uh, I see. Okay, okay, okay. Authorization. Okay. That one was definitely messed up. Okay. JSON post URL. Not to find, because I changed it to base just URL. Eventually, we'll, we should get an error back from GitHub, like unauthenticated or something. I'll need to actually fill in my token uh, key thing here. Oh. Actually, oops. Need to actually this here. Okay, right, there we go. This time it's sending some data. E error data. Line 50. I used to it being in the same tab. We might have gotten, I don't know. Let's print the whole thing. Not bother with trying to access one specific bit out of, ah, the control S. Bad credentials. Okay, that's what I was expecting. Bad credentials. So in order for that, I do need to do the token, uh, but then your script crashes. That's true, yeah, it would crash if it didn't get connected. And and if I were making this as like a real script to use in a real project, uh, I would be catching that error and retrying and restarting and doing stuff like that. In this case, it's just gonna be um, a test basically for this. So I'm not bothering with any of that stuff. If it does crash, I would just control C, control D. Uh, but that is definitely a good point. If it were like, you know, final project, uh, or if it were just going to be somewhere where it's inconvenient for me to control C, control D it through the REPL, uh, I totally would add like some try catches and some extra logic, like to basically make sure stuff is working how it's intended instead of just going on. So, what's the easiest way to do this? I think. You have multiple files open. I'm gonna pull this over to here because I need to look at the Toml file again. Ah, uh, it doesn't let me open it actually. It won't let you open files that aren't .py. It seems like. So I can't open settings toml. Problems parsing JSON. Okay. Now I think I just didn't send the data correctly. I think we can put a by cow in here. Let's 
Sounds not defined. How would you add new data? Uh, came in late. What's the goal of just API requests? So ultimately, my goal is to, I mean, first and foremost, just play with the just API, see how it works, because I haven't ever done it before. The thing I have in mind to do with it from Circuit Python is try to use it as a, an additional logging handler. So last week we looked at the logging library and some PRs that added the ability to do multiple handlers and then some examples that did a MQTT handler. And it got me thinking about whether we could have a handler that is a, you know, it sends logs to gist or paste bin or things like that. Um, so that's my ultimate goal is to try to create a new file in there and then ideally I want to be appending new stuff into it. Uh, I don't, it, from what I can tell, I can modify a file, but I would need to send the rest of the body again. So I got to look into that, that pulse of that part of it for sure. Pulse is not defined. I, we have JSON that's not valid, uh, Python. Like how most Pi emojis are red like raspberry. How would you add new data to it? Rather APIs than data to it. Not sure what you mean. Oh, I missed one actually. Are you gonna take ownership in chmod just to look at the file? Uh not sure I follow. Chmod. I mean it will be the only the file will exist inside gist and it will have the default permissions however it gets set up based on, I assume, my token or whatever. I don't think I'll need, I'm hoping that I won't need to mess with permissions really. Uh, do we have any other true falses? Nope, okay, so let's try that again. Testing data. Okay. Uh, we got back this thing, which has a bunch of stuff in it. The easiest to read in this format. So what I'll do is go to here. And copy. single quoted like it's python not uh python not json okay that appears to have worked i think guessing this is successful there's a lot of stuff here i have not looked through all of it but i assume if we got an error we would not have received so much stuff yeah. Comments, works, description, git push URL. There's our URL right there. It was an API URL though. HTML. Basically the same, but just instead of API. There we go. Okay. Revisions. If I... Revisions. Revisions we might actually be able to take advantage of. Or logging. Just are not private. Uh, anyone with the URL can view it. Yes, thank you. Very uh, good. Good um, point, excellent point. In my case, I am intending for it to be public. I'm not, I won't put anything private in here. Very, very, very good point though. Yeah, especially if anyone is ever gonna try to use this with the logging thing like this, like obviously anything you put into here uh, is you know not only going to the internet and thus like you're sharing it with a third party Microsoft, but 
by default it may in fact be be public although they do have private gists these days uh possibly you could somehow make it private instead uh but then you i mean you are still sharing it of course with microsoft the third party and then anything on your network that could see the see the traffic potentially as well and and if you don't go out of your way to make it private then it will probably be public by default or else that's what you should assume so don't put anything in there that is not intended to be shared publicly first time you get a proper key value response yeah check just yep uh okay so now we need to update though because we created one so the thing is like we don't want to create a new file every time we print a log we need to be able to update the file so creating is working oops i'm gonna go back here back here what i'm gonna do is basically say creating can you do like control yeah nice i'm just gonna get rid of data this one we don't need this Updating. Updating. Okay, I will have to be right back in just a minute. I gotta run to the restroom. I am not gonna make it. It's gonna try for a minute, but I am not going to. So I will be RB just a moment. Okay. So updating is different. We're going to need to give it the ID. At some point, we're going to need to work out, like, I guess what we'll do maybe is, like, so ultimately, my intention is to create a, an, a handler, much like the MQTT one. And I guess what we'll do is probably when you initialize it, we'll create the gist with a file in it. And then whenever you emit a new record, we'll try to just update that same file. So like if your device restarted, this would get reinitialized. You'd get a new gist. Um, but if your device just stays on and keeps running, then it will keep adding to the same file. That's my goal, hopefully. Should be a third choice where secret gists are truly private. Yeah. Yeah, I do not know which is default, but I have seen that option doing it through the front end for sure. But this is my first time messing with API, so it's definitely safest to just assume that it will be public. Update. So here we need to pass it the ID. Right, not in here. Is there control D? No. Nope.
node ID. Is this the ID right here? It's actually the same URL just with this added on, but it's all right. So we are not gonna update the description. We wanna update the file only. Interestingly, you can have multiple files inside one gist, which I didn't realize. Maybe we could have it do that. Maybe we have a single gist, but you get one new file each time it's uh, instantiated. That could mean that our ID stays the same, which would be nice. You could just hard code it in your settings file or something. No private repos were an option. Not like I have a use. Uh, maybe if for Teams proprietary stuff. Yeah. Yeah, GitHub, I think they had initially, I think they didn't, but I think they do now have private ones. ID. Yeah, would not be good. So do we, it's basically just the same data again. Right? Yeah, we're, but we don't, we're not gonna do a description this time. We're just gonna go files, which is a dictionary, readme, md. Object content new content inside of this file. So we would theoretically timestamp it as well. So like Testers. Ah. Headers will be the same. Give it a try. Hashtag draft. No different than any other cloud services. Oop, I really bumped up the scrolling here. Little private data, maybe stuff you're working on. All right, quite ready to go live. Yeah, smaller companies use GitHub infrastructure. I mean, it's relatively cheap, I think, to pay for the base level as well, too. And it is a lot of work. So, so I will say, just anecdotally, right, uh, I don't have that much experience, but anecdotally, the company I work for, we, we hosted our own GitLab for a little while. Uh, somebody that I worked with wanted to set up a GitLab and host that, and we stored our code inside of there, and it was actually a lot of work. Uh, once that person left, then it fell to me to like maintain that. And I was like, why are we doing this instead of using someone who 
has all of this infrastructure and like keeps it running for us. And I migrated us out of GitLab so that we were not hosting our own anymore. And it's like, I couldn't believe like just how much was involved with only the infrastructure of storing your source code. Uh, and when it goes wrong, you're kind of stuck. It's no good. I definitely walked away from that very much valuing letting somebody else be good at version control system. And then I just want to use theirs. Yeah. I do not want to host it. I think it's good to have a backup, like to download a copy of all your stuff every day or whatever, like make sure you have the latest version cached somewhere in case Microsoft goes away or something is definitely also a good idea, but managing that server yourself is way too much uh, trouble for what it's worth. So yeah, we have, uh, this should not be JSON response. Well, it sh I guess should be, but we need to do this first. Oh, control S again with that. Problems parsing JSON. Assume we get the same thing again. Yeah, we got it twice, in fact. Problems parsing JSON. Well, yeah, I gave it invalid JSON, I'm guessing. I will say there are a lot of, uh, we were talking about PyCharm earlier, and I am certainly very spoiled by a lot of the features in PyCharm. As far as editing code and stuff, I seem to have a syntax error here. Not quite jumping out to me. My guess is that if I were in the full editor, it might become more apparent. I guess our problem is actually just that we need to dump this, right? JSON.dumps. Surprise that didn't fail with a worse error, actually. Because that implies we sent something to the server. I'm surprised that we managed to send something to the server that it was unable to parse. I wonder what on earth we sent. Because, I mean, it was just a dictionary in Python, so, like, it's up to requests to decide, I guess, what it would do. It didn't call json.dumps. I wonder how it sent it. So, theoretically, we should see this here now? Yeah, okay. I could get behind this. Editing the file this way, so... At first, I was worried, like, if you wanted to append to the file, you'd have to, like first do a get request to fetch the current contents and then add your new stuff to the end and then post the whole thing back. As long as revisions are stored here, though, I actually don't mind just updating it one line at a time. And as you update it, the current file only ever shows the most recent thing logged, but the revisions continues to always show you the history? Or do we want to try to make it work with append? Even if just for the exercise, maybe it's a good idea. Does it call string? It could, yeah, I, don't, I do not know. I'm curious, I don't even know what, what that would do. The local editor. So this one is the code.circuitpython.org. Uh, it is like quasi-local. It's part of it's hosted from the device. Uh, I think you need internet access still though as well. I think it's pulling CSS and JavaScript uh, from circuitpython.org. I'm, I'm not actually 100% sure how it works uh, and which things come from where, but I do think some of this does come through the internet. Happy holidays. How's it going, Ask Patrick? Yeah, thank you. Happy holidays to you uh, as well and everyone else watching too. I believe the editor is CodeMirror, and that's the one that I use as well in the app. Yeah, it's pulling from cp.org. Okay, yep. Yeah, I made a version at one point that embedded more of this, but it was it made more sense to not to to keep the one that was fully embedded like super bare bones, and then it can like call out to the internet to fetch the more fancy versioned one. Every time I drop into the stream, I learn something new. Nice, happy to hear it. 
Um, back to here. So let's try it. You know, I think the revision actually is probably might be the best tool for what I was originally imagining, but I am curious. Let's see if we can get the contents. Let, let's see if we can actually append to it. See if we can actually append to it. I think that would be nice. If that would eventually stop working because, whoops. Oh, I don't know what I just did. It was not nearly as bad as I thought it was, though. My highlight works too. Oh no, it doesn't. There we go. Okay. That's what I was trying to do. Tabbing. Oh no, you can't tab? Sadness. We'll just keep doing the same file for now. So it'll be old content, new line, new content. Like you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't use it for a real-time sensor, temp sensor, but sensor updates every five minutes, yes. Yeah. Something like that is what I'm imagining, yeah, not... Uh, certainly not printing like multiple times a second or something. I'm thinking like once every few minutes max. Honestly, maybe even slower than that, like once an hour or something. Or, or I mean, really, my my mind, you know, in my mind's eye, so to speak, it's like when something goes wrong. This is like an IoT device which is on the wall or whatever somewhere, and it's like if it's not working, then you look in the gist and see what the last thing that it printed was like. If it's got errors or whatever, it will hopefully print to there. But yeah, certainly not like real time feeding sensor data back. That is not my intention to use that use it for. I need to look at contributing to CPU org web editor. That'll be easier than contributing the circup thing. I yeah, I agree. I need to look into this as well. One of the things I, there's a few things already that I know like control S keeps getting me. I would love for this to handle control S. The uh the built-in one does. Um so that would be really cool. Uh and I think I added that to the built-in one so that I have the JavaScript code for it somewhere, roughly speaking. I'm sure the save process is different, but all right, so this is going to be ready to post back. So theoretically, if we do the, if we do what the comments say, we should be able to do this. Let's look for git adjust. So this will be the same URL. So I think let's change this to, um, I called this update URL. Let's call it actually just URL.
Let's start with that. Do not need to send it any data this time. Keep going back to there. Let's actually put that back off for now though. Let's just get first, because we need to make sure, like we need to get our content. I assume it's going to be in this object, but we need to figure out where in this object. Connected. And print. Oh, we didn't call the function. Fair enough. That's fair. That is fair. Technically, I actually, I passed, I, I passed this in and then we just did it here instead. I guess I should put this like that. Do that there. I want to, uh, let me catch up there. Uh, if me say, if me, did you say control S and control Q? Uh, no, control S is supported in the local one the like this one if you go into here this has control s and it works i added it to here uh this one does not seem to have it though when you do control s it prompts you to save the html page uh control q i'm not sure about control q what is con i don't know what control q would do that one i don't know about i would like to get control s in this one though so Somebody, uh, you no near. Somebody mentioned. I think it was near. Doc mentioned a few minutes ago about getting into developing, like contributing to this portion of it. That's what I was talking about as well. I would love to figure out how to contribute to this portion and implement that control S to here. Learning a lot of great stuff on Home Assistant lately. Good idea. IoT that can actually talk to you. Maybe even a really old IoT device to make it smarter. i 3 v plus have their official high yellow hardware. Control Q undoes control S. Interesting. Undoes it? What does that mean? Like essentially control Z and control S? Like undo the last change and then resave the, the undone change? Undoes control S? Control Z, I would argue, should be undo. Doesn't handle control R, which is a carriage return without line. Almost every program I'm aware of uses Z for undo. Control Y is sometimes redo, yeah. Or control shift Z uh, is another one that's frequently used if they allow third ones. Low control codes. Okay, let's see if this actually does get our data. Control S stop serial. Control Q, restart serial. They were talking about different things. Uh, yeah, I do. I think we are talking about different things. I'm thinking Control S in the editor in order to save the code. Like I'm basically wanting, if I were to press Control S here, I'm wanting it to pretty much click this button essentially. Update data is not defined. Oh. Okay, I cut this out of the wrong one. We were supposed to cut this out of that one. Yeah. Ah, see, like right there, I just pressed Control S, like instinctually, cannot help it. I pressed it ex trying to get it to save, but obviously it doesn't. Gotta click the button. There we go, okay, so we got our data. I will need to look in this data, figure out where the actual Thing we care about is the files read me content. I don't know why this is not getting better. Uh, 
formatted, but that's what we're at. So if we said print JSON response files read me. Obviously we would change the file name here to a log file of some sort, but it's content. That should be the old content if everything works right. I don't know if everything is actually going to work right, but I'm going to do that anyway. Add the new content to it. So we don't actually need to do that. Um, technically, that's going to get done right there. So it doesn't need to be its own step. And then theoretically, we should be ready to paste back old content, new line, new content. So if that actually works, then I think we're good here. I will save it once without the post back just to see if it did actually work for fetching the content. Yeah, looks like it did. Cool. Okay, so that it should work if we turn this stuff back on. Date data here. Response, JSON, print it. We don't necessarily need to keep printing the whole response. Really, we care mostly about just successful or not, but that's fine for now. All right, let me catch up here. Okay, there we are. So control Z is the one I was thinking of when we guys talking about the editor. Yep, uh, not serial, yep. Uh, it's so confusing to mix control codes for editor commands with serial control flow. Uh, I would agree, although I don't know that much about it, I think. Hopefully a bit of that's over my head. On that note, what is control shift Z really supposed to do in the first place? You know, I, program, I, I prefer programs that do control Y because I get them, um, and I, I end up messing stuff up if I try using control shift Z usually. Then I get into a state where I can't get undone back to a state I want usually somehow, even though it doesn't make sense. And again, control C is usually copy, but in REPL, yeah, that's true. It is interesting control C, how naturally control C is like for copy, but also for, uh, you know, stopping inside terminal. You scroll highlight and right click, or is it left click? Do most things on a Mac, never realized control C is problematic shortcut. Yeah. Yeah, and the serial, usually uh, Control-Shift-C will work in some of them. Uh, if you're in, in really, really nice ones like PyCharm, <laughs> if you have in here, you can actually just Control-C. Regular old Control-C will work in here if you highlight stuff. A and it will keep it straight as well, because, you know, if you highlight stuff, Control-C will copy it. But if you don't highlight stuff, then Control-C will send it. So it's like, it's really smart about knowing which one you're trying to do inside PyCharm terminals. There is a context, uh, right click does have copy and paste in it as well. I think Mu uses, yeah, control shift C. That's what terminal does as well. That's what like this terminal here, if you want to copy out of it, it's control shift C. Uh, but PyCharm actually is just control C, which is one of the nicest things. One of the things I like most about its terminal specifically inside of here is the fact that it treats it as normal, just control C. So it looks like this succeeded. Let's go look at our thing here. We should have, a couple of lines in here now. In fact, yeah, we have three lines. Well, two lines? We have two lines and one of them is new. Hmm. Actually, we got both of these, but our new lines are not working. Do those need returns also? I'm so not used to, to editing in here. Do we need... Oh, 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 okay. Whoops, yikes, okay. All right. I just pressed refresh. Do we need this also? And also, does it come first or second? RN? Usually right click the REPL and move muscle memory helps prevent me from trying to throw. Yeah. 
That's true. Yeah, if you're not used to it, the control C will will uh, will wreck you pretty good. Raspberry Pi OS apps are very inconsistent with uh, control C V versus shift control C V. Oh. Okay. I mean, I don't really care, I guess, how it looks on this page. Maybe being a markdown in this case is actually making it weird. That could be. I think th I think that that's probably the case, honestly. If this were a plain text file, I think we might not have as much. Either way, though, truthfully, I don't really care what it looks like in the pretty one. As long as the raw one is has the new lines correctly, then I'm, I think I'm pretty much fine with that. This will create a new file inside of the gist, which is interesting because I thought gists were one file. Didn't update the URL. Seems like somewhere along the way, though, gists became just, it's like a repo, essentially, right? I think it's a full repo. It can have as many stuff in it as any other repo can. Or is this a different gist? Yes, it is different actually. Interesting, okay. Well, now, okay, yeah, now it's different though because I created a new one. But I guess the thing is if we had sent it to the same URL, okay, I wanna try one more thing though. Also, my camera did just die here. I haven't shown the camera in a long time anyway though, truthfully, maybe it doesn't matter. Could you embed? Uh, Unicodes instead of new lines? Possibly. Uh, I do not know. It's a good question. So I think that text actually will just make this better. Oh, the ID is going to be different now, too. So I'm actually curious what happens if you post to the same ID, but give it a different file inside the data dictionary. If you click edit on a gist, there's an add file at the bottom. Yeah. Read me. Oops. So not used to editing in here. Read me MD. Still? There we go. Yeah, now that this is a text file, we actually have proper formatting. Okay. I think that is probably where we wrap it for tonight. Um, obviously there's still work to do to use this how I, I want to do it, but I, and I think what we did is we basically knocked out the proof of concept and the API actual communication. So. At this point, 
we should be ready to just create a handler object, have it do the creation inside of here, have it do the updating inside of here. I don't think we need to do anything in there. And then we should be able to just use it as a logger object. Um, and that is where I am headed. But I think that that part of the exercise will wait for another day. Um, I'm going to call it here and go and get some dinner. But I am definitely happy to have gotten this portion of it out of the way. Also happy to have played with settings Tommel and the web editor. This is, again, uh, for folks that weren't around when we first got into this, this is my first time using the uh, code.circuitpython.org version of this web editor, uh, as well as my first time using any web editor on the Pico W. So I wanted to try out all of that stuff. It has been fun. I will probably find myself back into PyCharm sooner rather than later, uh, but it has been fun. I I'm happy for have doing this nonetheless. Um, and yeah, I feel like we're basically there. We got everything figured out as far as the gist API that we need in order to actually create a file and update it, which is all I need for the logging. So happy, happy with it. We did not run into that much trouble. I was expecting to have to do a bit more troubleshooting and honestly, it was pretty smooth sailing. So that's always good. Uh, that was awesome. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out, everyone. Um, I hope everyone does have a good evening as well as a good weekend. And of course, uh, a happy holidays. It's uh, Christmas for um, you know many folks in the world. I'm celebrating Christmas here in another two days. Uh, so you know, Merry Christmas to anyone who's celebrating that. Happy holidays to anyone who's celebrating anything. Uh, happy New Year to anyone who's not or um, you know is just more excited about the new year than anything else. Um, I will, I think I will be streaming tomorrow morning. It will probably be a shorter stream tomorrow and I'm not sure what I'll work on, uh, but I should be around in the morning tomorrow. So 10 a.m. Central Time uh, for my next stream. That'll be over on my, my own channel. I'll put links to that in the chat when I get started. Um, and like I said, we'll probably do a shorter one than, than usual, but uh, we'll hang out for a little bit tomorrow. Uh, anybody who wants to uh, sit and code over a cup of coffee with me, so. Have a good night, everybody. Uh, I will catch you 